Mr. Chancellor, Mr. President, honored guests, graduates, parents, ladies and gentlemen. May I introduce to this convocation the candidate for the doctorate honoris causa to be conferred by York University to philanthropist Michael Dan. This afternoon we honor Dr. Dan, who began his career as a professor of neurosurgery. He then left medicine to become the chief executive officer of Novo Farm Biotech. He then moved on to become one of Ontario's leading philanthropists and a visionary social entrepreneur, supporting human rights, peace in the Middle East, First Nations initiatives, and many other local charities. In 2002, Dr. Dan formed the Paloma Foundation, which financially assists frontline charities in the greater Toronto area that provide critical intervention programs for the homeless. Dr. Dan is now president of Regulus Investment Inc. and Gemini Power Corp., a hydroelectric company that partners with First Nation communities. He's also a board member of INSPIRE, an organization that invests in indigenous education for the betterment of both First Nations communities and this country as a whole. In 2015, he and his wife made a donation to create the Wakabines Bryce Institute for Indigenous Health, seeking solutions for health issues amongst Canada's indigenous population. Dr. Dan is a tireless supporter of the Canadian Museum of Human Rights, the Mosaic Institute, and the Scarborough Hospital Foundation. In addition to his medical degree, Dr. Dan holds a PhD in experimental medicine and a Master's of Business Administration, and is a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. Among many accolades for his exemplary public service, Dr. Dan has received the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal, the Order of Ontario, the Order of St. John, and the Order of Canada. Today we recognize a dedicated humanitarian. I present to you, Mr. Chancellor, Dr. Michael Dan, candidate for the degree Doctor of Laws, honoris causa. I hereby confer upon you, Michael, the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa. Admito te ad gradum. Mr. Chancellor, members of the Governing Council, professors, parents, partners, family members, friends, and fellow learners, it's an unforgettable honor to be here today. In many ways, York University is like a second home to my family. My wife, Amira, earned her PhD in social and political thought from York, and one of our children was practically born here. When it came time for Amira's thesis defense, she was already eight months pregnant with our second child and having occasional contractions. So, as she was being grilled by her thesis committee, I had the pleasure of wandering around York Lanes for several hours, worrying not so much about Amira passing her defense as about her passing a baby. Fortunately for everyone, she passed both with flying colors about a month apart, each on their respective due dates. Amira, I don't often get to say this publicly in front of 2,000 people, but thank you for your love, patience, support, and wise counsel over the years. You've inspired and critiqued and helped fashion everything in my life that I'm proudest of. I also wish to acknowledge and thank my father, Leslie Dan, who also holds an honorary Doctor of Laws degree from York University. Dad, you taught your children about philanthropy by example, and you empowered us to follow in your footsteps. This is something that we hope to pass on to our own children one day. And finally, I would like to acknowledge that this is the holy month of Ramadan and wish all who observe it Ramadan Mubarak. Where else in the world but Canada do you get an acknowledgement of traditional indigenous territory and Ramadan in a university graduation speech? To those who are about to graduate, tomorrow marks your first full day as York University alumni, and it also happens to be National Aboriginal Day. One of the most important teachings I've received from indigenous people is that everything is ceremony, and the ceremony you are about to participate in the act of walking across the stage in front of 2,000 people, academic gowns swishing in the air, collecting a piece of paper with your name on it, perhaps 
snapping a selfie with the chancellor. This ceremony is infused with deep cosmic significance. People who study these things know that graduating from university will add anywhere from four to seven years to your lifespan. So, if it took you four to seven years to complete your undergraduate degree, poof, you will now get all of those years back. Your student loans, unfortunately, will be still around tomorrow. <laughs> In addition to being better informed and making better health choices throughout their lives, university graduates live longer because of the improved social status that comes with the university degree. And social status is an important social determinant of health. So to the graduating class of 2017, if you do anything at all today, please take a moment to properly thank your parents, your partners, your friends, your close and distant relatives, and even the high school teachers whom you're still in touch with because they literally gave you the gift of life. Another important teaching I received from Indigenous people is that we must always think ahead to the seventh generation. Seven generations ago, nobody in my family had the opportunity to go to university. And even two generations ago, there were members of my family who grew up in Canada and who didn't complete high school, let alone attend university, because they had to work on the family farm. Things are quite different today. And in March of this year, the magazine US News and World Report ranked Canada number one in the world for quality of life and number one for education. Those are amazing accomplishments for a country that's only 150 years old. And I can assure you that in 1867, nobody at Oxford or Cambridge would have ever imagined that an underpopulated British colony in North America with an alcoholic for a prime minister would eventually boast the best education system in the world. But rather than get all smug about our achievements, we Canadians should pause and think about all those members of our, our society who continue to be systematically excluded from sharing in our great social accomplishments. Historically, Indigenous people in Canada have had some of the worst educational experiences imaginable. The system of residential schools, invented by settlers and imposed on them by settlers, lasted from 1830 to 1996. And even today, Indigenous people in Canada, whether living in urban-based or remote reserves, don't have the same rich educational experiences and opportunities as other Canadians. So there's a paradox at the heart of the greatest educational system in the world. An entire segment of society continues to be left behind, much to everyone's detriment. These problems won't get better by themselves, yet in December 2016, the Parliamentary Budget Officer released a report that made clear that inequities in First Nations education remain even after accounting for the new investments in Budget 2016. No university education means less opportunity to improve your social status and no extra four to seven years of life. Not surprisingly, the average lifespan of First Nations in Canada is about seven years shorter than the national average. And among the Inuit, the difference is more like 15 years. Thinking ahead to the seventh generation, it's important to recognize that Indigenous people are now the fastest growing, poorest, and most marginalized people in Canada. One in four children in First Nations communities live in poverty. In Nunavut, 70% of preschoolers experience food insecurity. The rate of TB among the Inuit is 185 times the Canadian average, and the HIV rate among First Nations in Northern Saskatchewan is higher than in Nigeria. First Nations children end up in foster care 12 times more frequently than non-Indigenous children, and 25% of our federal prison population is Indigenous. As Pam Palmiter likes to point out, it costs $100,000 a year to keep someone in prison. That's roughly the same cost as an undergraduate degree. Today, a typical First Nation youth is more likely to end up in jail than to graduate from high school, let alone attend university. But here's the good news. When Indigenous people are given the chance to attend university, they graduate and find jobs just like everyone else, perhaps even at a higher rate than everyone else. They move back to their communities as teachers, nurses, doctors, and entrepreneurs, and create economic ac activity on their reserves. It might take another seven generations to reverse the effects of colonization in residential schools, but we have to begin today, which means that it will, it will be up to you, graduating class of 2017, to do your share of the heavy lifting. 
consider this your last homework assignment. Your professors will check on you in 50 years' time when Canada celebrates its bicentennial to make sure that you've closed all the social and economic gaps between Indigenous peoples and settler Canadians. When the opportunities and outcomes are the same for both groups, then we will have achieved reconciliation. There are two more Indigenous teachings that I would like to share with you. Nothing about us without us is a phrase that you will often hear, and it resonates with the theme of the Tura Wampum Treaty, the oldest treaty between Indigenous peoples and Europeans. The Tura Wampum is a peace and friendship treaty originally negotiated between the Haudenosaunee and the Dutch in 1613. It's represented by a wampum belt with three white lines and two purple lines, all running parallel to each other. The purple lines represent the indigenous canoe and the settler ship forever traveling down the river of life together, neither touching nor interfering with each other. The three white lines represent the principles of peace, friendship, and respect. When we mark Canada 150 in a few days' time, it's important to remember that long before there was confederation, two sovereign peoples from two different continents met here in this place and agreed to share the space and to coexist peacefully as equals and as friends. Nothing about us without us is a gentle reminder of how friends are supposed to treat their friends. I wish to close, Mr. Chancellor, by exploring one last Indigenous teaching, the meaning of the phrase, all my relations. In the Indigenous worldview, all the two-legged ones are connected to each other, as well as to the natural world, to animals, plants, Mother Earth, the four waters and the sky, including the spirit world where our life's journey begins and ends. All my relations goes on forever, and we are all on this journey together, connected now by ceremony. Tentanda via, let us try the way. Let us all travel the river of life together and make the most of those extra four to seven years, building an even stronger, more equitable, and more inclusive Canada, so that our seventh generation will continue to inherit the best quality of life and the best educational system in the world. With all my relations, thank you, merci, Miigwech.